Well, good morning. This is a day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us quiet our hearts, let us prepare our hearts for worship.
Let us worship God. Lord God, we gather in this place, not because we are deserving of your love and not because we have lived faithfully before your face. We gather here because you have called us. You loved us before you could love you. You have given your Son for our salvation. For this we join all creation in blessing you, praising you, thanking you. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the giver of life. We pray for the church in the new world. Sanctify her life, renew her worship, give power to her witnessing, restore her unity. Give strength to those who are searching together for that kind of obedience which creates unity. Heal the divisions separating your children from one another so that they will make fast with bonds of peace the unity which the Spirit gives. Amen.
If we say we have no sin, the proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in Christ, we dare to approach God with confidence. The Lord be with you. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Lord, we have denied you by refusing to know you. We have betrayed you by keeping our distance. We have mocked you by pretending we are not yours. Lord, we are lost. Let your forgiveness find us. Welcome us into your strong, forgiving arms, and let us feel reconciled again. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting unto everlasting. The psalmist declares, as the heavens are high above the earth, so far will God remove our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Since God in Christ has forgiven us, let us also forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Grace to you and peace in our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, welcome. We are glad that you're here this morning at Westminster as we, with Christians around the world, celebrate World Communion Sunday. I'd invite you to take the friendship pad found on the aisle and to fill that out and pass it down the end of the row and back. This is not a sneaky way that we keep up with your attendance, but rather it's an opportunity for you to see those sitting around you to greet each other by name at close of worship. If you're visiting and would like to learn more about uh, how to live out your life of discipleship as part of this congregation, we'd invite you at close of worship to enter the parlor through the doors here and just around the corner. It's an opportunity uh, for someone to answer questions you might have. There are also tables out in the parlor uh, set up for ministries in the church. I'd invite you to stop by some of those today. This afternoon, I believe, is our uh, celebration of the Habitat House and I invite you to go and be part of that. Uh, Also, I'd like to invite uh, Gary Shockley forward to talk about the session's nomination process. Thanks, 
Sky. Good morning. I'm here today on behalf of the nominating committee to offer a gentle reminder that we are seeking your suggestions for the next two weeks for the next class of elders for the session. And perhaps you've often asked yourself, what exactly do people on the session do other than sit in the front row on the first Sunday of every month and try to look alert while they're worrying about dropping communion trays? Well, think about the things you love about this church, about the music, the youth program, the worship. That's all the staff. Think about the things that drive you crazy about this church. That's the work of your session. <laughs> so, if you want to preserve the things you love about this church, if you want to change the things that drive you crazy, then fill out one of these yellow forms and drop it in the box out here in the northwest corner of the parlor, or go online and fill one out. Make a suggestion for an elder. Thanks very much. The Lord be with you. God of grace and mercy, we give thanks and praise for the gift of these days and for the chance to hear your word read and proclaimed. By the same Spirit that inspired and has preserved these words, make them come alive in our hearing this day. Give to Donovan the gift of preaching. In our hearts, open and receptive to what you're saying to us through the Spirit, so that what might follow in ways that would give you glory. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, first chapter beginning at the 16th verse. Hear the word of God. The Apostle writes, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things God has made. So they are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not honor God as God or give thanks to God, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. 
claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. The Word of the Lord. continue a sermon series this morning that is loosely based on the Heidelberg Catechism and as I said last week the Catechism was written back in a day as a means to help some folks who disagree about theology, scripture, and sacraments to find something in which they can agree. And so the first question of the Catechism asks what is your only hope in life and in death? And the answer is, my only hope in life and in death is that I belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And on this we can agree. But oddly in the Heidelberg Catechism, living and dying in the joy of this comfort comes from knowing our misery. Strange that we have to know our misery in order to find our joy, but joy often comes from knowing what's missing. Like a woman who loses a coin, like a shepherd who loses a a lamb, a father who paces the front porch in search of a prodigal son. Knowing what you're missing makes all the difference as it was for me when my dear friend had cancer, riddled skin and bones. She began each day with the words, this is the day that the Lord has made. As if 
She knew what she was going to miss. She wasn't going to miss it. And she turned that light on in me. I never noticed a day before. But this is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. The catechism says we know our misery from the law of God. And here is the law of God. That you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Can you live it perfectly, asks the catechism? No, comes the answer. We have a natural tendency to hate God and hate our neighbors. And so this is our misery. Why does this happen? The ancients tell an old story to try to explain it. It is found in the third chapter of Genesis, verses 1 through 9. Hear the word of God. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, and he ate. And the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? This is the word of the Lord. Where are you? Where are you? Oh, where are you? The ancients believed that God, since the beginning of time, has been searching for us. That there is a separation between the Creator and the created. Where are you? Do you have an answer for God? Your answer may be why you came to church this morning. Where are you? Here I am. I am here, God, to give you all praise and glory. Here I am to do your work and follow your ways. Here I am to be your healing hands in this world. Here I am. Or maybe your answer isn't quite so noble. More like the pupil in the classroom. Where are you? Here. Why are you here? Well, truth be known, it's a bye week for the Titans. And I uh, wasn't here last week. Maybe should have been here last week. Maybe my prayers would have gotten the Titans through the fourth quarter. Maybe. Where are you? Here. I just know that I won't be here next week, and then, you know, the next week is fall break. I won't be here. Uh, this is basically my October. Here, Lord, here in worship. If you wouldn't mind, Lord, lick that little star and put it next to my name on the roll call in heaven. I'm here. Your answer may have brought you to church this morning. Your answer, or maybe the question. 
Maybe you want God to answer because your question is, where are you, God? Where are you? My life has had a tragedy. My job has got some worries. I, I, I have a big decision that I need to make. I need some divine intervention. Do I do this or do I not do this? Can you help me out? Where are you, God? Maybe you're asking that question after another week of a slaughter of the innocents. There have been 274 days in 2015 and 294 mass shootings. Where are you, God? Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down here, says the prophet. Where are you, cries the psalmist. My tears have been my food both day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? Maybe why you came to worship this morning, because you long for a blessing, because you long for the touch of God. You know the misery, and you so deeply need some joy. No more distance, please. No more distance, please. No more distance. That's where our story begins. No distance. It begins with humanity and God so close together, close. It begins in paradise. It begins in a place where everything is good. Can you imagine a place where everything, everything is good? Some people call that the kingdom of heaven. We had it in a garden. It was paradise. It was good. It was a peaceable kingdom. The lion and the lamb, they could just take a nap together. The air was filled with flavor and there was not a sneeze anywhere. The mosquito got by on looks alone. <laughs> and God was as present as your next breath. Everything was just as perfect, just as perfect as you could ever imagine. But there must be something about perfection that is absolutely boring. I can't explain it otherwise. Was it when Eve got back from the golf course and Adam said, well, what was your score? And she said, another 18. I just hit the ball, it goes into the cup. Hit the ball, it goes into the cup. Hit the ball, it goes into the cup. This is the most boring game ever. I'm going to quit. I'm just thinking that there is something about perfection that must be boring. Something that needs to listen to the whisper in the back of the head that says, there surely is something better than this. I mean, why else would you listen to a crafty serpent in paradise? Because that's the temptation. The temptation of the, ser the, the serpent wasn't, do you want to do something bad? No. No. The temptation was, don't you want to do something better? Don't you want to be God? Don't you want to sit in the seat of judgment to know good from evil? <laughs> evil? What's evil? Oh, said the serpent, I know it all looks good. But take a bite and you'll see. You will not die. You will become like God, and you'll see. And suddenly, we could see. The lion devoured the lamb, just like that. The mosquito stabbing the skin. The pollen is so thick. And suddenly, we, we could see that we needed to be ashamed about what we look like. Oh, the garden of good and evil. Just like that. Ashamed of what we look like. 
I remember the woman who was crying because all the other girls were teasing her little girl. She said, I just want to choke those kids. They're so mean. And I'm so angry. I'm so sad that they can't see my daughter is beautiful. She's my girl, and she doesn't deserve anyone, any any of this. If they could just see. Where are you, God? Where are you? Cried God. Behold the garden of good and evil. Suddenly we could see that some things are better than other things. And I want the better things for myself. (laughs) The garden of plenty becomes a garden of scarcity. Love just evaporated. Why, I do believe, Cain said, that God loves my brother more than God loves me. (laughs) I'll have to remedy that. And he killed his brother, and he put his brother's body in the ground, and he just slapped the dust off his hands. And he said, now I can have God all to myself. And God came around and said, Cain, where is your brother? I've been calling for him. Where are you? Cain, where is your brother? Have you seen seen your brother? And Cain said, I'm not my brother's keeper. And God said, listen, shh, shh. I hear your brother's blood crying from the ground. Where are you? Misery. When you know what you've lost, when you bear the scar, when you know the distance between heaven and hell, between God and neighbor and ourselves, neighbor and ourselves, neighbor and God, God and ourselves, when you know the distance between Just out of curiosity, how many people can you name with whom you have to keep a distance? How many people have you separated yourself from? Well, if you've separated yourself from someone, According to a literal interpretation of Scripture, you have separated yourself from God. Scripture says, you cannot hate your brother and sister who you see and love your Lord God who you cannot see. It's our misery. And this misery is what we have in common, (laughs) this distance. What else I think we have in common is that we are able to hear at least one thought from every human being on the face of the earth. Did you know that? I mean, if we really listen, we can listen and hear one thought that every single person on the face of the earth has You hear it. You ready for it? Here is the thought that every person on the face of the earth has. Here it is. You ready? I hope they accept me. Everyone has that thought. It's the thought, the first thought you ever have when you're born. 
I hope someone accepts me. It's that thought you have on that first day of school. I, I hope someone accepts me. The mother who cries for her child because all the other girls says, yeah, she's ugly. Her cry is, God, I hope they accept her. The cry of that little girl, I hope they accept me. I imagine if you are a visitor this morning, if you've come here looking for a church, I bet you that is your thought. I hope they accept me. And when you know the answer, you will either come back here or you will never come back here. Now, if you don't come back here, just know this. That when the people who are here find out about it, they ask the same question. I wonder why they didn't accept this. <laughs> it's this distance we have. We have it all in common. We have trouble with it. And yet, it is the thought of every person in this world, every single person, even in that, that boy in Oregon who took that gun to that classroom. He just had a hard time being accepted. And I cannot accept what he did. Do you, you think God ever had that thought? I wonder if they'll accept me. Listen, the voice is in the blood. Where are you? Come screaming out of that blood. Where are you, my brother? Where are you, my sister? Where are you, my friend? Where are you, my enemy? Where are you, my lost? Where are you, my broken one? Come. Come. Enough of the misery. Let us share what we have in common. Blood and body and death and life and communion and God is here. Come. Let us stand and say what we believe. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God has already demonstrated God's judging and saving work. We live in tension between God's warnings and promises, knowing the righteous judgment of God in Christ. We urge all people to be reconciled to God not exempting ourselves from the warnings. Constrained by God's love in Christ, we have good hope for all people, not exempting the most unlikely from the promises. Judgment belongs to God and not to us. We are sure that God's future for every person will be both merciful and just. With gratitude for all the blessings God has so richly bestowed upon us, let us give out of our life and labor our tithes and offerings as the ushers wait on us.
Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Scripture reminds us those will come from east and the west, the north and the south, to sit together around the Lord's table. This is not a Presbyterian table only, it's the Lord's table. And he invites us to come to be fed and be nourished. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The Lord be with you. <laughs> Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, for you looked upon all your hands wrought and called it good. You smile upon purple mountains soaring above wildflower plains where grasses raise their backs to meet your spirit's caress. You send clouds scuttling across reflective waters and set stars to wink upon the earth in deep knowing delight. You call the tune for dolphins dancing in the play of waves as giraffes amble across savannas and birds sing in full-throated praise and children of various hues giggle as they run free in your image. Despite your created goodness, we use our freedom for ourselves alone without regard for your intentions for all. 
Still you chase after us to save us from sin's harm, freeing us from slavery to give us a new world flowing with milk and honey. When we chase after other gods, you call us back to, through the cries of your prophets, which we ignore, until at last you send your own child to be for us the goodness we refuse. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the choir of creation and all the saints of all time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Christ for coming to us as a little child, live baptized in the muck of our fallen world, embodying God's desire to bless all people. You spoke peace to a warmongering empire and were blessed to be a blessing to all people. And threatened with the terror of crucifixion, you did not keep silent, but stood up with resurrection, new life to turn the bread of human affliction into the manna from heaven, and to turn the better dregs of our sin into the cup of joyful celebration. So we await your coming among us in your fullness of your sovereign glory. We proclaim the mystery of faith. Praise be you, Holy Spirit, blowing through time to aliven your people, the church, to live as Christ's body in God's ministry of repairing our broken world. Come over us now with your bright brooding wings in the breaking of bread and in the celebration of this cup, that our eyes may be open to recognize Christ among us and in all who share this feast. Knit us more closely together in the fellowship of your sovereign way. We offer ourselves, our lives, our resources to be your hands reaching into a world with your unfathomable compassion. Fill us like breath fills flutes to be instruments of your peace. Where there is lack of regard for your creation, prod us to speak up. Where people fail to see the dignity of all persons, open blind eyes. Where there is silence about others being hurt, impassion us with a desire for justice. Lord, your creation groans under abuse. Renew the earth with goodness. Your children are starving across this globe. On this World Communion Sunday, we remember before you your church. All of us here today, yes, but also the millions of people of every race and tongue, every nation and clan, every fellowship and tradition of worship within the Christendom that come at your invitation to be remembered at your table of grace that commemorates your death and your life. Strengthen, we pray, our collective witness to your incarnate love as we speak out against injustice, idolatry, everywhere. We remember especially the church in places of persecution and danger, especially in Syria and Iraq and throughout the Middle East. In our own land, O oh God, we cry out against senseless violence. And as we remember all too well the devastating effects of the flood here five years ago, we pray for those in the Carolinas, especially in Charleston, who are dealing with the devastation of the storm and flooding. We remember before you those in need of your healing touch, those in fractured relationships, those living with family members with mental illness or addictions, those who walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Here at this table, surrounded by the great company of your saints, meet our deepest need. 
gather all these prayers and praise through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, forever and ever. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant shed in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all of you of it, for as often as you eat this bread... And drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the living God until it comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Draw near with joy and thanksgiving.
Lord be with you. Also with you. Gracious God, you call, where are you? And we have come. And we have received this joy of this feast that you have provided. We pray that we might go out into this world, this world who is crying for the touch of God. Where are you, they cry. Help us to be your hands, your arms, your feet, your hands, your love into this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good to hear you sing. <laughs> and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, and all God's people said. <laughs>